Richard Davison from um, from um, the Nottingham Nottingham um, Children's Hospital. I'm a PICU consultant, so I'm feeling a bit uh, out of depth with. Presume that does anybody here work with children, or is it adults? No, not little bits. So a very small ones, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> But I'm going to talk to you about, about um, paediatric ventilation, evidence practice, and then a bit of magic at the end as well, which is uh, always good when you have our magic wands. Um, so the first question is, um, why, um, why are children different to ventilate? And these are pretty obvious things, but they have dramatic effects on how we ventilate children. Firstly, they are smaller, the clit is smaller, they're more elastic, and they're more resilient. And each of those four things are fundamental to the, the differences in, in um, the, the approach. First of all, they are small lands. So, so here's the neonates, probably around one kilo. Um, I work on PICU, not neonates. Uh, but last year, our weight range of our patients was between 1.4 to 140 kilos. Um, that's a you know, hundredfold weight of weight differences. I can imagine the effect that has on on just writing up drugs and equipment and everything, we need to have huge rooms full of kits from this size to the huge children, teenagers as well. A simple maths, if you're ventilating someone at five mils per kilogram and the 1.5 kilos, that's seven and a half mils of tidal volume. You know, seven and a half mils. Um, so the accuracy of how they ventilate, the accuracy of the machines, and thinking about dead spaces is um, critical. The next photo is, I confess, from our unit, and it caused one of my consultant colleagues to almost have a fit. Um, this is a patient is ventilated by tracheostomy. Um, so this patient probably around three, four kilos, and can you see the amount of dead space we subjected this child to? Um, and ventilating, you know, four kilos, maybe 20, 25 mils of dead space, and we've got all these connectors, and even the, the um, um, elephant tubing thing is all expanded to increase the dead space even more. Um, that was rapidly changed to enable this child to actually get rid of some CO2. Now, the kit is smaller. That's very obvious. But when you're dealing with uh, a size 2.5 ET tubes, and so the internal diameter is 2.5 millimetres, um, everyone's favourite physiological equation, the hagen plus equation, which shows the relationship between flow and the delta pressure, the radius, internal radius, um, the length and the viscosity. It's radius to the power of four. Now we spend a long time in PICU thinking about flow dynamics for circulation, for ventilation. And the incredible thing is if you have a, a ET tube size 2.5, if you were to increase that to a size three, so just only going up by half a millimeter, because it's to the fourth power of the radius, you are doubling the flow you get, or you're decreasing the, uh, by half the flow resistance. Um, so tiny changes um, can make a huge, um, huge difference. Um, securing the tube is difficult um, because you have a small face, you have small tubes, they are sl sort of slippery, there's not much to actually stick to. So um, it's a bit of a uh, running joke that when we go and fetch a patient from a DGH and the lovely adult physicians and intensive care consultants and anaesthetists have all been very helpful. And what we do is we just, first of all, we retape the tube um, because it does need practice. Um, a kink risk. Now, these tiny tubes, if they're not straight, they kink and then the patient can't ventilate. And often, because of the difference in tidal volumes is small, the ventilator may not pick it up, so 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 have to be really really careful uh, to watch the uh, the tube itself. And suctioning, if you're using a size six or seven French um, suction catheter, um, so those um, those catheters, you know, they're 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 two three millimeters in diameter. Well, you, you can't get much stuff out of it. Um, the gunk in a chest is just as just as gunky as in adults, but you just can't suck it out. Um, here's an example of a patient whose whose tube is beautifully strapped with, with plenty of strapping, um, nice, uh, nicely um, put up around the um, tube as well, and you can see how the how the ETCO2 monitor is nice in line, and there's no risk of kinking, 
So this is a well technically strapped patient of ours. Um, they're more elastic as well. Now this is a patient who is, is just um, having a chest strain put in. Has anybody put a chest strain into a baby before? Um, when you're putting the chest strain in, it is very disconcerting because the chest wall bows in, okay? And you're trying to pop the dilators through and everything is going to go and it's uh, very disconcerting indeed. Um, the, um, the baby's chest walls, children's chest walls, they're elastic. So the, the cage of which, which causes the, the mechanical efforts to breathe, if the lungs aren't right, the, um, we then have cage failure, essentially. Um, so recession, intercostal, sternal, subcostal, um, supersternal. Um, that really affects the, the efficacy of breathing as well. Um, the more resilient, um, this is a bit of a bizarre video, but this is a, uh, a um, village tradition in a village in India oh, that hasn't, that's, uh, where to welcome babies to the world, uh, they chuck them down and then they're all fine. Okay, now I'm not sure that uh, social services would quite be uh, happy with that, but... You know, welcome to the world. Um, I'm going to chuck you off a building. Um, but babies, babies can cope with this, okay? And they're very resilient. Um, as an example, our mortality rate on PICU, we do, uh, we're super regional at PICU, our mortality rate is about 2.7%, um, which is around, as a broad figure, it's about a tenth of uh, the, the mortality rates on adult intensive care. I'm going to base the rest of his talk around this young man who has caused uh, probably 40% of the grey hairs which are appearing on my, on my head. Um, he, um, he came to us a few years ago and um, he's a great example of how we ventilate children or how we try to ventilate children and uh, what, we, what, we, what, what, um, what we attempt. Um, he's got um, his story started on Christmas 2015 um, he's three-year-old, just under three. He's normally well boy. Uh, the toddler was running around and came into A&E with a spontaneous pneumothorax. Now that's odd. Um, we don't um, see this often at all. Um, he, um, he had it drained, improved and discharged, had a few scans, had a few um, shoot, um, shoot investigations. And then about uh, a couple of weeks later, he represented to his DGH in cardiac arrest with bilateral tension pneumothoraces. Luckily, the, um, he's at a daycare and uh, the, 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 the nursery nurses there had just been on a um, first aid course and managed to keep him going. And I went um, to retrieve him from the DGH. Um, he's resuscitated, stabilised and taken to us uh, with all the normal caveats of post-hypoxic uh, cardiac arrest patients. Um, he then... Um, and he recovered um, from that episode, uh, was extubated. Um, he then um, had multiple ongoing pneumothoraces and he used to uh, wander in. At one great moment, um, he came in for driving a little toy car and gave him ketamine, put a chest string in, and he, and, um, he drove away again. He's, uh, <laughs> um, these are his uh, CT scans, which uh, caused some jaws to drop. Um, so this is... Uh, an axial scan and this is a coronal um, CT reconstruction um, and those were the lungs we were faced with. Anybody want to tell me what diagnosis is? It's pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Very good. Um, incredibly rare in children. It's often associated with adults who smoke. Um, this boy didn't smoke and nor did his parents um, but the mother-in-law did so she was in much trouble. Um, <laughs> The risk, risk in children is thought to be about 1 in 10 million, so astoundingly rare. Um, and the difficulty with this condition is it's entirely treatable if you can get them through the first bit. Okay? Uh, we, um, we consulted globally about this boy, and we came across four cases of which one had survived and two had died. Uh, but if you survive, if you get through the first six weeks or eight or two months or so, then you probably will get better. That's a big but there. 
So progress. Um, he had a constant need for chest pains, uh, and the week before Easter, this is um, now 2016, uh, he had pneumonia. You've seen how much functional lung this boy has. You do not want to have infection in the rest of the lung. Um, and he had then had a severe deterioration, um, had a had a seizure, had well, was intubated for uh, multiple failures of lots of organs. But then we have a problem, don't we? Um, plan A was do not ventilate this boy whatsoever because it's going to be an absolute nightmare because of all the different tongue constants and the different different bits of his lungs which will need different um, ventilation areas. And the uh, propensity of his lungs to pop uh, as well makes any um, positive pressure highly dangerous. So we started him off on conventional ventilation. Now, the first question is pressure or volume ventilation. Um, there are people who have their favourites. Uh, my attitude to such things is if we knew what the answer was, then everybody would do it. Um, <laughs> And everybody does different things. There are, there are types of ventilation which are favourites and which are the first options, but actually there's not one mode of ventilation which everyone uses. The next question is optimal tidal volume. Now, the problem is that there's no real evidence in children. Um, the adult trials are relatively clear, I think, nowadays. Uh, but there's no high-quality evidence in children um, there is some evidence uh, from preterm sheep, baboons, and rodents. Um, now, um, the neonatologists you know, may uh, complain, but you know there are some parallels. Uh, um, um, from these studies, also they're not they're not randomised. Um, they're not they're not in, com in comparisons. They're just what happens to these uh, these uh, these lungs if you ventilate them in high pressures. Proper pediatric trials, there are none. Okay, so what are we going to do now? This is a um, before-after trial, so the, 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 the patients from the um, the late 1980s, early 1990s, compared to the mid 2000s, um, where they where they looked at the recent group and the past group, and you can see that the past group had a higher mortality than the recent group. Um, one of them, the independent variables with an odds ratio of 1.59, was that the tidal volumes were lower. They, are, they, are, they are, had, an, had a median of 8 mils per kilogram in the recent group and 10 mils per kilogram in the past group. Okay, so as our time has moved on, we are better at intensive care. But one of the important things was that the volumes had dropped. And look, people survived, the children survived better. That's good news. We now know the answer, especially um, here's the same trial. And you can see there seems to be a really nice association here. The higher the tidal volume, the higher the mortality. The lower the tidal volume, the lower mortality. Lovely. <coughs> um, but unfortunately, um, the study had no graphs attached to it. But then there's a registry study in, of all patients in Australia and New, and New Zealand which showed a lower mortality with higher tidal, tidal volumes. Um, there's a retrospective um, single, single um, centre study which showed no association between tidal volumes and mortality. Higher PIP was worse. Um, the reasonably large in the paediatric field, three, the 389 patients. And actually, you know, there's no statistical association here, but with the eye of faith, if you look at mortality, it's kind of lower on the right-hand side and higher on the left-hand side, so mortality is lower-ish with higher tidal volumes. Um, the same study um, looked, at, looked at tidal volumes against baseline lung injury score. And again, there, the, what the, the patients with, with uh, the higher lung injury scores had lower tidal volumes, and the patients with lower lung injury scores had higher tidal volumes. Um, there's a registry study um, which showed that survival, survival rate was modestly higher in those treated with lower tidal volumes. So now it's higher with lower. There's no, there's no, there's no statistical association. Um, but again, this is, um, uh, they looked at the threshold of 8 mils and 7 mils per kilogram, and both of them showed better with lower 
kind of volumes. Um, the two center observational from America and the end with more than 300 patients showed no association between tidal volume and mortality. So I don't really know what to do now, do I? And it kind of makes sense, you know, you should treat lungs, lungs are as sensitive organs, you should treat them gently. Um, so we try to treat them as gently as possible. There are some, uh, um, some animal studies here, so um, uh, which looks at the differences between newborn and adult animals, um, often in rats. And we show actually um, with that, that newborn rats um, have lower rates of lung injury um, than adults. Um, the different studies um, with, different, with, different, with different amounts of, uh, of um, tidal volumes. Um, 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 using mils per kilo in rats, apparently I learned this on the train on the way down. Mils per kilo is not, it, it's not entirely appropriate because their, um, their total lung, uh, lung capacity is not linear with their weight. Um, but even if you use, you use a ventilation volume of 50% of total lung capacity, even then, um, adults get more lung injury, injury um, than, than, than infant rats. And the same is seen in, uh, in mice as well. So we have data for adults, adult humans. We have data for baby rats. Uh, in the middle, there's a, there's a crossover there, which we haven't yet found. Anyway, it didn't work. Uh, we couldn't ventilate this boy um, with conventional ventilation. Uh, it just didn't work. Um, his CO2 was through the roof and his oxygenation was horrendous. Um, we were in 100% 100, 100 oxygen and his sats were sliding, sliding, sliding. So we tried high frequency. Now, does high frequency work? Well, it depends who you ask. If you ask the books, then the answer is probably no. If you ask PICU people, then... Uh, we would not get rid of high frequency. And standard adult pr practice, it's generally not used anymore. That's correct. Um, in pediatric practice, it is. Now, um, we can always, uh, we, um, we have a get out clause that the studies haven't really been done because th does it work? Well, in this study, it doesn't. Uh, the, um, the, the red, uh, um, the red and the green, the, and the green, uh, um, well, our curve, our, the curves are at high frequency, and blue and green are, are the, uh, um, um, they're the highest quintiles. Um, but this, uh, the other study showed um, that there was high mortality with high frequency in children. In children, although this was, uh, this was, sorry, sorry, uh, this isn't a mortality on. Um, of y axis that this is um, patients um, who are still ventilated. Um, so, so the high frequency patients were, were ventilated for longer. Um, but actually, it, it does work according to this study, um, which has looked at um, um, the effect of high frequency in children and showed um, that the, um, the oxygen oxygenation index fell, uh, fell faster than with uh, conventional ventilation. Um, on the other hand, in a um, non-randomized study, um, which looked at which looked at um, different different ventilation uh, criteria, but um, the propensity matched um, two groups from high frequency and the conventional ventilation. Again, some um, high frequency uh, prolonged the um, the length the uh, length of ventilation. Um, this study, though, there are um, some criticisms. The propensity matching is to some groups not not thought to be appropriate. Um, the neonates, um, they made no difference um, to survival, and um, um, the neonates um, had, um, had lower amount of surfactants, um, but they had high, high, high levels of interventricular hemorrhage. Um, so it made the patients survive the same rates, but with worse brains. We do not want that at all. But it does work because um, um, here's a 10-year experience in a sensor um, which, which shows um, how the saturations improve, the CO2 goes down, the pH improves, and the FiO2 goes down after starting high frequency. And um, this is used as rescue therapy. So this is used when we cannot carry on um, with, um, with normal ventilation. Now, this is the only... Um, randomized trial in pediatrics and um, with high frequency ventilation. 
If you look at the small print right at the bottom left, it's from 1994, so that's pretty antiquated nowadays. And um, this is a this is a smaller study, um, but it did show that uh, that um, um, survival and good survival was better with um, with high frequency. Uh, so in this study, it did work. But not mentioned um, the Oscar or the Oscillate trials, and um, there were the two adult trials which which uh, which nailed down the coffin lid in adults. But actually, there's been there's been now there's been a um, a meta analysis of these patients and um, have looked at the the uh, the PF ratio and looked at the odds ratio of death compared to the PF ratio. And what you can see is that actually potentially on the left hand side here if you have a worse pf ratio so pf ratio the lower the worse um actually then the odds ratio of death goes down and if you have a higher pf ratio so you're not as sick um then oscillation may work and may and may make you worse so we use oscillation for the sickest patients it's very hard to randomize and um, to get these studies um, accurate because the patients um, who put on to the oscillator um, and they are really, really, really sick. Um, but maybe um, here's, some, here's some data which shows that as rescue therapy, it may still have, um, have some, um, some effect and something worth thinking about. And maybe um, we're doing it wrong. Um, Martin Neiber um, from the Netherlands um, has just been funded funded um, to do this study called the Prospect Study, which is going to be a forearm study which looks at a two by two table of proning and oscillation versus supine and the conventional or the other way around. Um, and um, he and this study um, has a very a very interesting oscillation protocol which is called open lung open lung um, oscillation. Um, when you start at high pressures, you come down and um, some kind of few loops of the of high pressure weaning that to find the uh, the um, the correct physiological uh, mean airway pressure um, for oscillation. Um, this study has just been funded, as I said, it's not it's not actually started yet. So we are being very patient and waiting for the results from this in many years time. But it didn't work. Okay, we put him onto the oscillator and it was horrendous. Um, he just dropped his saturations and had to bag constantly and things were looking very, very bleak. So then we uh, tried some APRV. Uh, and now APRV we use, we use almost as a, on the same part as oscillation on our units. Um, one of the big problems with oscillation is we use what we call the tractor, the Sensomedics uh, oscillator, which sounds like a tractor. And you walk onto the unit and you feel, da -da 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 -da. And you feel the floor shake as it oscillates big children. It's amazing. On the other hand, it is super dependable. It's very, it looks like something from the 1950s and it just works. It's like the Land Rover def Defender of, os of uh, the ventilators, but there's no feedback. So if you're 82 blocks, it just keeps on going chugga, 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 chugga. And the first you'll notice is when you do a guess. Um, APRV has certain similarities um, to high frequency, um, with the benefit that if the tube blocks with this mode, the machine will go bing and tell us about it. Okay, so there's a bit of a bit of a bit of benefit there. So the question is, does the APRV work in children? Well, there's been one trial. Uh, proper randomization so far, which was stopped early because uh, patients died. So that's a bit of a problem for APRB, but it does work. Um, um, here's, um, here's some survival in adults, uh, which shows that, that well, actually, um, that, and this is, uh, this is um, the percentage um, who, um, who are breathing without assistance, a pretty dramatic difference there um, um, to the benefit of of APRV. But then it doesn't work because um, here's a trial which uh, randomized 58 patients and as you can see uh, it's, a, it's um, reasonably parallel. But did it work? Well it kind of did. Okay, And essentially 
it stopped him from dying, which is, uh, you know, that's a start, isn't it? I mean, we can, we can, be, we can be relatively pleased if uh, the saturations weren't dropping at that stage. So this was Easter Friday. Um, and this, uh, the um, saturations were in the, in the 70s on APRV with 100% oxygen. We were unable to, um, to oxygenate him. And the parents were advised of the situation. We had nowhere else to go with this child. Uh, the, we called the organ donor team, um, who are on the unit, who are making phone calls to discuss whether we, uh, he was appropriate, whether we could offer his organs out. And the parents were, I uh, recall clearly, you know, this is the, the end of the line, and it's down to him. And then on the third day, he rose again. Uh, on Easter Sunday, <laughs> suddenly the sats went from 70 to 72 to 73. And uh, he came back slowly, slowly, slowly until um, we could ventilate him, at least in the, set, in, in the 80s. And we were all feeling very pleased with, with ourselves. But then we had a horrendous situation where he was incredibly fragile still. And what do you do then? How do you move on with this boy? Because he's really properly on a knife edge. And if he goes the wrong way, there is no reserve, there's nothing to do. So I made some phone calls and said, I need that new fancy machine. And I spoke to well, Leslie, I spoke to um, one of the guys, one of the guys, yeah, I said, I said, when Echo um, who was out in Japan at that time, I think I woke him up at two o'clock in the morning to say, mm -hmm. I need this thing. And uh, fortunately, it arrived in the back of a truck. I had to sign my life away and and I could use it um, by Wednesday. And now Puma Vista is electrical impedance and tomography. And this is where the magic comes in. Uh, because this, when, when we used it the first time, was, was jaw dropping. Um, I want to tell you some of the talk about it I'll talk about some of this purely afterwards, yeah. uh, but um, it gives you a live, a live view of um, every single breath, about um, where, uh, where the expansion is happening with, uh, within, within the lungs and uh, what it looks like. And crucially, uh, when you make a change, it shows you what's happening um, straight away. Um, we still had, we still um, had maximal ventilation. Um, at that point, had five chest strains within him because uh, he keeps on sealing off um, small pockets and popping them. And this is um, what we cobbled the together for this boy. So this is, uh, um, so um, um, for EIT, electrical impedance or tomography, you need to have 16, 16 electrodes on at the chest with a 17 for the reference. Um, there were no, no suitable belts of his size. And anyway, um, chest strains, you can't go through the plastic because you need skin contact. Um, so we had to use 16 um, ECG dots in a kind of straightish line and uh, wiggle it around his body um, and um, I try to get contact, the contact like that. You can see there's not much real, real, real estate left on this boy's chest, uh, what with uh, Hickman line and chest strains and things. Um, so it helped him. We bandaged around, we bandaged around his, uh, um, his electrodes um, um, for better contact. And we got uh, just a summary slide of um, what we found. So the, the top pictures are, are um, tidal volume pictures. Um, it's like a CT slice. Um, the, uh, the heart is on the, um, the posterior left. Um, so the um, anterior is at, at the top, posterior is at the back. And right and left are as normal they are um, when they're switched over. Um, the works of the heat map, it's a live video works of the heat map and you can see the whiter the image the uh, more expansion has happened in that in that, that area so uh, when we put it on um, there wasn't much expansion happening see this big hole here and it's all not not very white okay um, so there's not much expansion anywhere within within his chest you can also look at the global impedance waveform here so this is a trend over time where each of these spikes is one breath and you can see that's very very high yeah I then, I then I made some changes, and you can see instantly on the middle, the middle, um, the picture. You can see that there's much more expansion happening in the 
um, right posterior, and there's more in um, the, the left hand left side as well. Um, but the expansion, the expansion um, was quite low then, so the global expansion, um, we're ventilating on a different, a different part of um, the expansion curve, and even though we were getting, we're getting um, better, like better, the, the better chest movement as shown by the, the, the top picture, um, the expansion was too low and um, the sats weren't right. Um, so, 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 and we then, we then made more changes and optimized things from the from the ventilator flow, and and I uh, can see let's see on the third picture, the third picture is a much more balanced ventilation picture. We have ventilation in all four quadrants, and on 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 uh, the um, like global expansion expansion lines, we're sort of in a mid in a mid expansion curve at the moment. Okay. Um, so, uh, what enabled us to, to do then um, was to make changes and have confidence that we didn't have to wait for the next blood gas or wait for the sats but to change. But we could, we could on a theoretical basis say, well, I can see after this change the ventilation is different in this area, better, worse. I'll reverse that change. I'll do, I'll do um, something else. So we made more progress in those two hours then um, than in the previous week. Um, um, which gave us which gave us a confident ventilator manipulation and um, had a gradual improvement to to, to extubation and um, these are his total numbers 26 chest strains 102 chest x-rays and five ct chests and he is the cheekiest monkey you will ever find he runs around um, comes to our patients and just runs in in his um he always, um, he always um, has a different superhero outfit on and um just is like a whirlwind it's amazing um this is his latest ct scan um that's the same slice as i showed in the beginning and you can see there are a few holes left but uh, at least he's got plenty of lung to breathe and um, he's off oxygen he's beautiful um we we now use i use electrical impedance so tomography I'm down to about about um about um, three kilograms. Um, we're not using stickers anymore. We now have uh, very nice prototype belts, um, which gives us an excellent um tool in our armory. In a few minutes, I'll just show you some um some ways um, that that we use this. Um, so this is a patient um, who's ventilated nicely, who then then taken off for suction. You can see um when when they were put back onto the ventilator how much the chest had collapsed um how much um, how lower the um the uh, ventilation is uh, to the extent um that this patient's um sats fell had to be bagged to the huge big bags here uh, with great expansion uh, put back on at a slightly higher expansion level and then you can see slowly slowly um the um, the expansion is increasing 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 um, and eventually they'll get back up to their, their pre-suction um, level of expansion. Uh, that's the effect in a sick patient, so that's the effect um, that some suction that can have. Um, we use it to kind of to, to, um, um, to, or to tell us if this patient may or may not um, be, um, be approaching extubation readiness. Um, so you can see on, on the bottom trace here, that even within, within five or six breaths, as the, as the patient's almost up to the previous expansion. If a patient is acting like the first patient, then they're nowhere near ready to wean. Um, we use it um, for PEEP optimization. So um, here's a six-phase PEEP trial uh, on a child with bronchiolitis. Um, so the green, the green curve here is, is um, the PEEP levels from 14 down to six, um, or four, sorry. And you can see the um, the white lines here are the are and um, the chest expansion, and then the software will tell you at high peep um, which areas um, have stopped moving, and at low peep which areas which areas um, have stopped moving, with the consideration that areas which stop moving at high peep, um, they're they're hyper expanded, and areas which stop moving at low peep are collapsed. So you can choose your peep whatever it is, but actually if you look at the curves of yellow is high, is, is some high peep movement loss and white is, white is low peep movement loss. At a peep of nine, that's, that's sort of the least bad peep. 
again, depending on where the best peep is, but at peep of nine, you, you have the lowest amount of, um, of um, collapse and the low, lowest amount of um, hyperexpansion. Um, so we now, we now choose our peeps based on this, and if we, we go for the least bad option. Um, we've done we've, I've done a few of these now that these are last last winter's bronchiolitis patients, and there seems to be just some some association there. I know this but not, but not a lot of data there, but some association that the younger younger children um, prefer uh, prefer to have um, lower peep, and that older children prefer to have higher peep. Um, we've used it um, for decisions decisions on pleural effusions. This is a very sick patient um, whose INR was seven, um, oncology patient in multi organ a multi organ collapse, who we couldn't uh, couldn't correct the uh, the clotting, and the question was with those lungs um, and a pleural effusion, should we drain that pleural effusion or not? Um, where's the risk balance? We couldn't ventilate her, but then are we going to cause problems? Um, by putting a chest strain in, um, and uh, we saw um, that there was no expansion in this huge area of lung here. So on balance, we put we put the drain in, and instantly um, we reinflated the back of this lung, and we could ventilate her, and she didn't bleed with the with the um, with the chest strain. So it's a double win. <laughs> um, this is a patient. Um, she was uh, two years old and um, had coronavirus pneumonitis, and she kept on kept on um, the collapsing her left side and then her right side, and then, and then, and then her left side. So we we watched this live, and then and then I was told the bedside nurse as soon as one side goes darker, I then flip her over. And as we told um, mum, we um, we flipped her like a burger, and. Um, <laughs> Um, every time um, the right side, you can see on the left-hand picture how the right side, there's not much ventilation there. So we flipped her right side up. After a couple of hours, um, the right side's ventilating fine. The left side isn't. We'll flip it the other way. Yeah? I mean, you can do hourly chest x-rays. You can do this, but actually that's pretty... Um, the patient will be, um, will be glowing after it, I know. Um, weaning... Uh, weaning um, success. Um, here's a patient who, um, who dropped the ventilatory numbers on, and you can see how the the global global expansion is gradually dropping. So every breath they're losing expansion. Um, that in half an hour's time is going to cause you problems. On the other hand, um, here's a patient um, same a same drop in ventilation, and you can see um, how the patient can cope with that. They're not losing volume for uh, of every breath. Uh, that patient is going to be fine in half an hour's time. Um, asthma and wheeze is fantastic because when we think we have a child who um, who's hyperexpanded, you know, we think we do, but actually, are they hyperexpanded or not? Um, and if we uh, if we make a ventilatory change, is that going to cause them to be more hyperexpanded or, or less hyperexpanded? Um, so on the bottom here are the ventilatory numbers and. Uh, um, the top is um, the global impedance, which which would, would equate to global expansion, and with it, um, we made a change, and we're delighted to, to see the hyperexpansion reduce. On the other hand, the 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 obs weren't right, um, so, so, so then um, we made more changes to the second arrow, and you can see it's a slight increase in expansion, um, but we were we were happy with the obs then. So we actually we, we found a way to um, to drop the expansion down significantly and still ventilate the patient appropriately. And even in um, he's a teenager who had a um, incredibly um, severe lung a, a lung injury from vaping. Um, don't do it. <laughs> um, then wanted him wanted him let's take a bigger breath and the physios have used it used it um, for feedback spirometry. Um, to and that he was told let's make sure um, that it went blue in the whole the whole area and that was that was um, his challenge and he quite enjoyed it um, watching the rather hypnotic screen is it but it's but, but, but it pulses like a jellyfish it's quite nice thank you um, so just um, um, that's a little little um, a, an overview of of um, of um, how we ventilate children and the uh, the lack of evidence.
essentially again, you know, if we knew if we knew the answers, then we wouldn't be here. And uh, hopefully one day we'll find out how to do this even better. Thank you. Thank you very much.